Good afternoon and welcome to CSIS. I'm John Alterman, Senior Vice President, Brzezinski Chair in Global Security and Geostrategy and Director of the Middle East Program. I'm delighted to welcome you today for a discussion about a recent Chatham House study, Rethinking Political Settlements in the Middle East and North Africa. To discuss that study, we're joined by one of its authors, Dr. Renad Mansour, Senior Research Fellow and Project Director of the Iraq Initiative at Chatham House. He's also a senior research fellow at the American University of Iraq in Suleimani and a research fellow at the Cambridge Security Initiative based at Cambridge University from which he received his PhD. We're also joined by Fareh al-Muslimi, a research fellow at Chatham House's Middle East and North Africa program where he focuses on Yemen and the wider Gulf region. Previously, Fareh was a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Middle East Center and the Middle East Institute among other organizations and in 2014, he co-founded the Sana'a Center for Strategic Studies, which he helped grow into Yemen's premier think tank. He's a graduate of the American University in Beirut. We're also joined by my friend and colleague, Natasha Hall, a senior fellow with the Middle East program at CSIS for more than three years. Prior to joining us, she spent 15 years around the world as an analyst researcher and practitioner in complex humanitarian emergencies and conflict-affected areas. She has special insight into the Syria conflict, where she worked with the White Helmets and May Day Rescue. So we have what I think is a really important and interesting new study, which Renat is gonna tell us a little bit about. And then we have people who can talk about how to think about the application of this study to different conflict-affected areas and how we go from conflict into a post-conflict settlement environment. So, Renette, tell us about this study. What were you trying to do and what were the principal things that you found? Sure. Thanks, John. It's a pleasure to be here and very much looking forward to, to this discussion. Um, myself and a few colleagues uh, have been studying some countries in the Middle East and North Africa, Iraq, Lebanon, Libya, and we were, we were kind of working in this space of stabilization and uh, that really became an important foreign policy tool and development tool for uh, the United States, European countries uh, going into the Middle East and North Africa. And we found that it was predicated on a sort of trade-off. Uh, that trade-off was stability, so going for stability, but at times at the expense of accountability, right? Because there's a civil war, you have you know, militias, armed groups shooting at each other, Let's bring all of the elites together to, onto the table and let's negotiate a peace. And so, this, so the guys with guns <laughs> are the ones who are brought into the room. Yes, with the politicians, with social leaders. The idea being that elite bargains, which became in particular in the United Kingdom a, a, an important concept, but in general, uh, anyone working in political settlements in the last decade or so really pushed this idea, right? Because Previously, liberal peace building, this idea that elections could bring democracy really wasn't working out. So there was, we need to sort of take a more pragmatic approach. Let's bring all the elites together and let's have them carve out what they can get in sort of this sort of like economic rationalism, you know, uh, have them be part of the system. So you incentivize them to be incentive structures. inside of the tent. That's right. And that was the logic, right? Very much economic, very much rationalist. Um, and it worked in stopping civil wars in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Libya, in, in the countries that we were looking at. So it, 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 it proved sort of useful for stability. But then we began to see that it, was, it also entrenched tremendously corrupt systems because these elites, as they carved out the spoils of the state, uh, weren't redistributing with their societies, with their constituencies and their social bases. Ultimately, this created, in the medium term, destabilizing factors, right? And we saw uh, corruption in the medical sector in Iraq, for example, meaning that 70 to 80 percent of medicine was fake or expired because those same elites were now working together to procure contracts to take money from the state, right, but to use it to, to, to become wealthy themselves. And people were dying. And so we started to look at violence not just as the men with guns shooting at each other, 
which was initially the point, but actually in more structural terms, right? Hospitals that catch on fire because their health and safety regulations aren't strong. Or in the case of Libya recently, dams that, are, you know, that haven't had proper maintenance because there's been a lot of contracting fraud and these elites have been take, taking women on the side, not doing the maintenance, meaning that when you have something like a flood or like a, a storm, these dams are more susceptible to, to, to failing and, and resulting in the, in the lives of tens of thousands. So what we saw was while these elite bargains, while these political settlements effectively stopped casualties from civil war, they in many cases perpetuated more casualties sort of in a, in a less visible way through structural violence. And, and, and what I thought was one of the powerful things in the report was you talked about how the intra-elite bargains are about violence that's horizontal between elites, yeah. and the structural violence is the violence that's vertical between the large parts of the population that has to live there yeah. and the elites who exploit them and fail to deliver services to the population. Exactly, and corruption needs to be on the agenda. Corruption not just to understand how a political system works, but corruption that turns deadly. And that's what we've seen in all of these countries. Um, and, and so when we go back to that trade-off, right, and we're talking about what actually can be done, right, now that we've learned that these types of political settlements that seem pragmatic, that, that tend to reduce the direct horizontal violence, aren't, are actually perpetuating it, you see that levels of corruption have stayed the same, and you see that human development in these countries has been poor. Right, so so birth is you know birth defects, birth morta child mortality, uh, low life expectancies. These are all different ways in which people people are dying more than they you know should because of corruption. And so when we go back then to the drawing table, right, as as trying to come up with okay, what could work better going into these countries for international policymakers? It's a understanding what trade off actually means, understanding that. Setting up a political settlement may reduce some lives, but it may lead to a catastrophe with the tens of thousands. And that conversation needs to be there at the beginning. More broadly, accountability can't be something that comes next, right? Because it's always a crisis. It's, always, it's a civil war. Let's not talk about accountability because right now all we need to do is end the current violence. That can't be the case because it hasn't worked. So we need to have a longer term vision from the early days of coming out of these types of uh, violent environments. Natasha, you and I have talked about similar issues. You come out of deep experience in the Syrian conflict. How does what Renaz just laid out, how does that relate to the kinds of things you've seen both in the Syria conflict, but more broadly in your work in the, in the Middle East and around the world? Yeah, I mean, first I just want to commend you on the report. I think it provides a really helpful lens for viewing these problems. And John actually sent it to me immediately when it came out because we had been talking specifically about these issues just within the narrow context of water security, where we have scholars and policymakers really laser focused on the potential for water wars or elite bargains on water, and not really looking at the structural violence that's inherent uh, in everyday lives of, of citizens, right? Um, but I mean, getting back to my own comments, I actually wanna up the ante a little bit. I think it's not just a trade-off of accountability. I think it's the opposite of accountability because essentially what it's doing is, is rewarding impunity, right? Essentially, I mean, what I see at least in, in Syria is that the Assad regime uses things like Captagon, for example, as leverage in normalization talks with regional powers, right? So essentially what this we're This is doing, an illegal narcotic right. manufactured in <clears throat> Syria and sold, particularly around the Middle East, that profits the Assad regime and, and creates problems for, for probably millions of young Arabs. Right, so I mean, I think that this essentially, I mean, it rewards bad behavior, the, mm -hmm. you know, bad be behavior being a euphemism for human rights violations, war crimes, and the corruption that you're talking about, which can be so, so deadly. Um, and then incredibly, we're surprised when conflict returns. Mm -hmm or refugees don't want to go home, or in the case of my own country, Jordan, where you know, two thirds of the population under 30 want to leave the country, mm -hmm. right? Because there's just not a future for them there. And you know, I think that what's helpful about this report is that we as human beings, I mean, we tend to understandably be focused on outbreaks of violence or handshakes between old men, right? Um, that's what the media focuses on. But I really think that the Middle East is more defined by those silences in between that you're really trying to talk about um, or speak to. Um, because in those silences, 
people are really trying to survive in broken systems. Elites become entrenched. They take control of basic services. And they essentially become too big to fail. And so that's the situation that we have, not just in conflict-affected countries in the region, but I would argue all of the countries of the region, where you have you know, IMF deals with you know, Tunisia, regardless of the human rights violations going on there, because people are really afraid of migration, of violent conflict, of, of anything else that could potentially follow. But I hope we really interrogate, I think, some of the recommendations, because I, I think that this is, I'm humbled enough to know, as someone who shifted between practitioner and analyst, that I do not have all of the answers, and that we, I mean, we're trying to, I think, resolve some of these, these issues, we're, we're, but the challenges are so tremendous that, you know, I think uh, these are very broken systems and broken people, and I think it's gonna take more than duct tape, more, you know, aid, some sanctions, elite so, bargains so, to fix. So let, let me bring Fari into this because, yeah. I mean, Yemen, in many cases, was an example of an effort to avoid just the, the very small elite deals at the top. Yemen had a national dialogue process that was part of an effort to transition from Ali Abdullah Saleh, a, a dictator for decades, to uh, a more popularly embraced regime. All kinds of groups, I think 400 and some odd people were brought into the national dialogue process, intended to represent all kinds of different constituencies in the country. And yet, Yemen dissolved into civil war. Reportedly, in part because the Houthis and some southern groups, elites, felt they hadn't been dealt in enough. So, Faria, tell me, as somebody who's thought a lot about that and lived through the consequences of the failure to bring elites in, how do we think about that balance between elites can disrupt everything, but you don't want to merely bring in elites because then elites perpetuate their elite status? The good news is I'm not a UN envoy, so I'm not worried about that problem <laughs> of striking it between the horrible and who should be on the table. And if I knew any magic questions for you, I would answer. But what I wanted to say a few things in that regard is, and I called Renat the minute I finished reading the report before it went online. I was like, Jesus Christ, every paragraph you say in this is also about Yemen. You have done the framework, I can just change the names, and then we, we have a very similar story in that regard. And I think that is also similar in Yemen and why it resonated with me as a researcher but also as a Yemeni is you can really trace everything back in Yemen to the same point of elite bargains. It did take a different names and titles, sometimes in DC, sometimes that, but it was that. And for example, when you look into 2009 in Yemen, we were on the edge of an election. By that time, actually, a political deal between what was known as the joint meeting parties, the, uh, the political parties, and Saleh's party, and that deal actually was sponsored by the U.S. and by the international community to delay elections. So it was a, an elite bargain between the main political parties. And suddenly, obviously, it didn't last long because the Arab Spring broke out in 2011. And instead of ending this exclusivity of power of elite, what happened is there was a new deal that was happened between elites, which was called later as the Gulf, uh, the GCC initiative in Yemen, again between Saleh and the opposition parties. The NDC, as you said, in 2013 National Dialogue Conference was probably the first time this elite bargain was put into some sort of an end. Basically, you basically had first the youth, you had the civil society, you did have a process. And that process also, I think, was important because it wasn't about categories or about uh, youth and women, but it was also solidarities around issues. So transitional justice, state future, and that held a little bit, disseminate the elite conversation and created solidarities for people beyond political parties, beyond geographical representation. But because it was a deal that did not include accountability, it governed unconditional immunity to Saleh, then we witnessed after it, a very soon, a cycle of violence. You know, in Arabic, we have this proverb that says, uh, Man amin al aqoba sa al adab, who, who, who's, who's sure there will be no punishment, will most certainly misbehave. And that was what the elite deal was giving in the GCC deal. Saleh was given an unconditional immunity. 
So he thought he can do whatever he wanted. And that was, again, the problem of the elite parkings that always parks on the side accountability for the sake of security, for the sake of geopolitics, sometimes for the sake of delivery, for HQs, whatever the reasons are. But we saw after that immediately the Houthis took over. Because again, and even at Sharam House, we did a uh, big work on this in 2013. You look before 2011 and post-2013, you still had 10 families in <coughs> Yemen that controlled 86% of the entire economy. Of telecom, oil, export, import, weapons, perfumes, all the way up from the tank to the needle. It was by 10 families in Yemen. So the entire political process was, again, still between these political uh, uh, economic centers. And everything remained on the bottom, on the medium level. And that stayed, I think, uh, the problem of that. And always anything after that, it was, that was always the ready recipe for any headache, for any problem. It's okay, let's bring the elites into the group. Let's have deal with them. That happened in 2018 in Aden by the Saudis when they brought their factions together. Again, it was an elite deal. That happened again when they created the Presidential Leadership Council. Again, it was an elite deal between 10 different factions. None, the Yemenis has nothing in it, in this kind of an entire council. And it's a similar process right now happening between the Houthis and Saudi Arabia, which is an elite deal barking in a different way, obviously. But it's still the same. The entire Yemenis are out of that. So, so let me ask, Renat, I mean, you have lived through Iraq's gyrations for the last 20 years. There are people with guns who are willing to disrupt. How do you make things move forward without co-opting them? Are, if, are, are they, they, it seems to me in many cases in Iraq, they're too powerful to easily coerce. And it's especially hard for outside parties because they have to live with the consequences for 100 years and the outside parties have to deal with the consequences for a year and then they move on. Mm -hmm. That's exactly right. And I think underlining you know, what we've been saying and what we've actually said is I would focus on this, this idea and issue of impunity. Um, these elites who come together and design these systems um, never give up their impunity. They keep it. They'll build a government, they'll build foreign ministries, they'll build the system, but the condition is, you know, we keep, we stay above the rule of law, which means that if something goes wrong, they have that power. Another important power they have is access to arms. In Iraq, if you don't have access to arms, you, you don't have a, a strong sort of foot to stand on. You, you, you can't negotiate politically. So these groups, you know, it's and that's the, true in Libya as well. In, in Libya and in, you know, in many countries, right? It's, it's coercive capital, you know, it, it's social power. Um, and in, in, in the way that these states are designed isn't the kind of neo Weberian state that has mm. a monopoly over legitimate violence. It's much more an arena uh, where different groups rely on their coercive apparatus, their, their arms, to negotiate politically. And so the rules of the game and how violence is used isn't the way that we would think of it. You can fire a missile on a city, but not designed to kill anyone, but designed to negotiate. Violence is politically inclusive because it's part of the elite bargain. They have agreed that violence can be deployed to negotiate within the confines of the, the agreement for the system. So you, you've triggered me by using the word arena because that's a word that shows up a lot mm. in Ellen Lust's book, Everyday Choices. I was talking mm. with Ellen in this room a week ago about her book. The, the point of her book is that we're really used to dealing with sort of states as rational actors, and international actors love dealing with state counterparts. International institutions love dealing with state counterparts, except that within the state, there are a word she continues to refer to as non-state arenas of authority, a sphere of activity with clear membership goals and institutions. Okay. Uh, where citizens, public service providers, and even state officials are members of various communities, such as religious orders, mm -hmm. family or kinship groups, that's Fadi's 10 families that own Yemen, ethnic communities which make claims on them and shape their actions. So this is a reality that within all states, and especially states in the Middle East, you have these multiple arenas that sometimes capture parts of the state that sometimes operate within the state, 
that people rely on instead of the state mm -hmm. for protection, for social insurance, for all those things. How sh should we think about those operating simultaneously with rational state institutions or in place of rational state institutions? Natasha, in, in Jordan, you've seen all of these things come into play. Yeah. I mean, just to quickly summarize Ellen Lust's book, it's, you know, it's this focus on the state as the premier apparatus for how different services uh, are, are provided and, and choices are made. But the reality is that people at the, you know, at the level in Jordan, you know, you often have, she has this example of a Jordanian woman voting for a politician she doesn't like. I mean, we would see that as an irrational choice, but what makes that rational for her? What makes it rational for a Yemeni policeman, for example, to seek the permission of a sheikh before he arrests somebody, right? That the, there's these other arenas of authority that take place. And that is more exacerbated, I think, during times of conflict, right? Because people they have to survive within this system, right? Like while we're busy as development agencies or governments or donors trying to strengthen institutions and often failing to do so, people are on the ground trying to survive and making these everyday choices, as Ellen you know, points out. And I think that you know, the people on the ground in, in Iraq and Syria and whatever, they have to go to that local militia commander. They have to go to that uncle that knows how to sort of pull strings for them, right? And when that becomes deeply entrenched, it is very difficult to untangle mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and really ask people to trust institutions or a government that they've never been able to rely on. Uh, and that's sort of the reality. And I think that's what we're seeing across the Middle East, that this, even this sort of fragile social contract that has existed for decades is really breaking down. And I think that that is, is strengthening these other arenas or authorities uh, in Yemen and in Iraq, I mean, really across the board. I think it's pretty notable in Lebanon, especially where the government has never really been strong uh, since the and Civil there's, War. And there's significant public support for precisely these elites because of what the elites provide that nobody else will right. or nobody else can. And, and just to feed off of that, I mean, I think that there, we, we can't underestimate the fear that people have. I mean, it's not just the global north that fears this direct violence between elites. It's also the people themselves that have lived through it, right? They don't want to, they don't want to return to that kind of violence as well. And they'll live on a knife's edge for years, if not decades, in order to avoid that too. Speaking of Lebanon, by the way, which I lived quite many years there, um, and it's speaking of this elite bargain, it did have that, it was probably the first in the region that launched elite bargain and based on uh, sectarian identity politics, which was the Taif Agreement. And when, what, what, what happened there is not just the, right now the collapse of the state, as we saw, the new violence, all of that. But speaking of the absence of an accountability and how it empowered warlords and got them to hold the Lebanese people as a hostage, to me personally, for example, post-Beirut explosion, which I was in Beirut, the second day you look into Beirut, and it's like any city post the war. So when you, when you think of what was happening inside Lebanon for 15 years, to me, it was like Saada, it was like Adan, it was like Abiyan. If this was not a war that was being launched for 15 years, then what is a war? This is, this is it really redefined the idea of a war inside my head. You know, it was always what we understood. It's a guns, as Renad is saying, but Lebanon, you know, it was a, a war of the elite, a war of uh, bankers a war of unaccountability that ultimately ended up with that city and with the country as it is. But that's um, yeah, something and, maybe you can speak more of. And what's interesting is, you know, we're talking about elites and going back to this, but a lot of the elites don't actually sit in the government, right? Yes. They don't yes. need to. Yes. Um, in fact, they're more powerful outside. You can have, speak to power in society. They'll send their people, and governments are often staffed by prime ministers and presidents who uh, play the role of what would be that sort of state. But really, p the power of the state is outside these institutions. You can see that clearly in, in many of these examples. What also becomes interesting in Lebanon, uh, in Iraq, in a few places, is the nature of the protest movements that begin to emerge. These protest movements are no longer against a specific leader mm -hmm. or against a specific party, but they're against the entire system. So in Lebanon, they say, kullun yani kullun, which means <coughs> all of them means all of them. Mm 
right? In Iraq, it's the same. We are against muhasasa, the political system. So this is a response to elite bargains. This is a response to these political settlements by the people who have diagnosed the problem head on. They're the ones who have figured it out. They've said, it's not a party. It's not an ideology that we're against. It's not a sect or ethnicity. It's the elite. But when you have elections in these places, and we've seen this in elections in Jordan, we've seen it in elections in Kuwait, we've seen it in elections in Iraq, that, that people oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes vote for tribal representatives, elites. Uh, they, they have tribal primaries to decide who the tribe will vote for. I mean, even when you have democratic institutions and democratic processes, they often don't produce what you would think of as democratic results. They produce results that are based on something like Mohassasa, something like uh, a tribal division, a sectarian division of spoils, because people say as an individual, I'm isolated and weak. But as a member of a larger collectivity, somebody is looking out for me. So part of the elite bargain mm -hmm. is a sense of protection, and it's partly voters who are institutionalizing mm. this I mean, elite bargain. If I can push against that, I think first you can say the same about the US. They voted for bad choices in 2016 and before and after. I mean, it's not the people usually there who takes these decisions and election decisions in a thoughtful way. I think the problem, for example, in Yemen and in others, in which elections have sometimes necessary not brought the best example, is because of the economic cycle that goes to the elite bargain. A man or a woman is never free until they have their own credit card. So, of course, their own credit card. So, of course, people are hostage, whether that's to the Houthis in Sana'a or to Hamas in Gaza or to Al-Hashd in Iraq or to Hezbollah in Lebanon. It is because the entire economic center and the entire breadwinning is still a rentier controlled by these elite bargains, no legitimized and normalized by deals that continue to increase this gap. I'm close to certain if tomorrow there was a free elections in Yemen, the Houthis will not get 5 to 10 percent. I know that. I see it on the ground. You see how people like them. But is that a process of, a t of, of composing elections without the larger package and the right framework, as Renad is saying, including a redivision of power? Is it going to bring a different results? No. But I think the problem is the process we have and the framework rather than the very specific decisions And if of I people. can add to what Farah is saying, another dimension, who's voting? What is voter turnout like, mm. right? So these social leaders, the tribal leaders, the politicians, they have a base and they're going, they'll get them out to vote. But a lot of these people don't vote in these countries because they, what's the point? They've learned, they tried elections one time, two times, they realize elections only reinforce the same elite bargain. Groups that have won that were outside the elite pact have not succeeded in many of these countries. Yes. So many people just don't vote, which means that voter turnout is low, which means the only people who are voting are those who are voting because they're part of it. They're in the social base of the mm. elites. And so it's very interesting. These leaders, even though they're clearly not interested in democracy and accountability, the idea of an election, the legitimizing function that an mm -hmm. election serves is still important to them. This type of competitive authoritarianism that you're seeing across the region is important. They need to present themselves as democratic, even though they're not interested in actual mm -hmm. sort of accountability. So how, so how do you shift the system? Because you're describing an entire system which is self-perpetuating, which citizens acquiesce to, how do you, what, how, how as an outside party, as a, a donor state, as an international organization, as an NGO, how do you dislodge that bargain? I think when you're trying to get something, for example, in Yemen, in the ground done uh, with any official, the first thing I don't the first thing I do is not read the law and the bylaws of the ministry. I definitely, yes, you're right. I first try to find out who are they married to and map out that. The networks. And networks mm, yes. and map out who they are. And then you try to take it from there uh, before even the text. But I do want to say two things. And I think they're back to the initial points Renad was making and back to your point about how do you strike the right balance. Let's say, for example, in the Yemen case, if I go back to 2011 and there is a, a way to do to redo the GCC deal. What is the one element I would add into it? 
I would take the immunity aspect and make it conditional. So at least you can strike that moment, you become a pragmatist, you do a diplomatic open heart surgery, very tough, not necessarily the best one, but then you move forward and you make it conditional. Tomorrow you Saleh misbehave, we will sue you for 30 years and we will put you in jail. Instead of that, even the most minimum level, which give just a free pass to everyone who wanted to do that in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Lebanon, all of that. In Lebanon, it worked a little bit at the beginning of the war when they have a, a goat escape that was Samir Jaja for a few years. And then, but after that, everyone just made a deal and then it became impossible. But I think that conditionality of trying to kind of swallow yesterday, but think of tomorrow is extremely important. And the second part, mm -hmm. which goes back into what the paper looks into stabilization and between elite bargains. I think a fundamental problem today with the international interventions, whether in Yemen or Palestine or Iraq or Western policy, whether that's an NGO or a government, is what you were saying earlier, is this a classical conservative radical thinking of a state and state counterpart and the way that you deal with the other side, the way <laughs> Western diplomacy, which is still the dominant diplomacy in the world today, is built on a feudal system of a feudal thinking, a counterpart. What did this do ultimately in your policies in the region, in my opinion, whether that's the US or the UK? You didn't end up recognizing groups like Hamas and the Houthis, for example, which is good, but you ended up normalizing with their tools. And that's even more dangerous, in my opinion, in the long term. So the current entire intervention, because it's a counterpart, it's a diplomacy, it's a state to a state, it's a display book that even if it's not written, what it ended up, of course, it kept the self-perception about not recognizing, but in my opinion, it did a more horrible stuff. It normalized. Today, you cannot do a single aid in Sana'a without the Houthis going through them. So you're hostage to their aids, but you don't even get the privilege of having to engage with them or, or to recognize them. So that is, I think, a fundamental rethinking that needs to happen in the international mechanism of interventions, well, not just in Yemen or the region, but globally. And that, I think, applies to government and humanitarian organizations. But I think you can say much more on that. No, I think, I think that's right. The only thing that I would add in terms of what can be done is not all the elites we're talking about are corrupt. And not mm -hmm. all the people in these political systems are corrupt. In fact, when you map out these networks, you might find a node, an isolated person here or there who is a reformist, who is socially connected, who is absolutely devastated and disgusted by the corruption that's causing so much harm. But the one thing that all of these people tell us when we, we interview them is they're alone and they're isolated. <coughs> and alone they can't do anything and so they're stuck. So how then can international actors and those pursuing development programs and trying to build state institutions strengthen the connective tissues between these reformists who exist in these networks? How do we remove that isolation and create this type of reformist current to push, right? Because we know that public pressure matters. We know that these people exist. How do we connect them to create some kind of reform trend? So can I challenge you a bit yeah. on that? Because I, I really want to interrogate that yeah. recommendation because I've heard it before. Um, we know that political violence is mm -hmm. just embedded in the system, right? We know that these reform-minded technocrats or even elites, they exist. But there's this political violence at play, yeah. right? And a lot of the people that I've talked to in Iraq that are you know, just environmental activists are either exiled, arrested, mm -hmm. detained, or th they're forced to play by the mm -hmm. rules, which doesn't really get them mm -hmm. very far, right? Um, and I think that the issue with these e years of cyclical violence is that human life becomes pretty cheap, right? I mean, in the years of apartheid, I had friends in South Africa that, you know, told me that people would get killed for a cell phone, right? So if you're, if you're challenging or threatening mm -hmm. millions of dollars in contracts, which is what you're talking yeah. about, right, for these elites, uh, I, I think your life is going to be pretty cheap really quickly, right? And so I don't... I say this not to sort of admire the problem, but like how do you get over that hurdle? Mm -hmm. And I would add sort of a second challenge to that, which is somewhat related, which is that we're entering a multipolar world where these people have protectors and benefactors mm -hmm. within the region that provide military support, they provide alternative networks of trade to sanctioned actors, and they really minimize the tools that you say the global north, the global north has mm -hmm 
right. to even deal with these problems, even if they wanted to deal with these problems. Mm -hmm. um, and I saw that over and over again in, in Syria, right, where the U.S. was sort of disinclined to act because Russia was involved and Russia was more committed and Iran was involved and Iran was more committed and, and we just didn't have the sort of the bandwidth mm. to deal with it. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I, I say this again, humbled by the challenges <laughs> that exist, but how do, you, how do you overcome that in a place like Iraq, in a mm. place like Yemen? I mean, especially a, with the proxy wars, how yeah, do you deal a critical, with that? Yeah, mm. it's a very critical point, and, and certainly the risk is, 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 is there, right? These are countries where the law is weaponized, where mm. you can be arrested <coughs> for tweeting you know, right. something that's disrespectful. Um, the police, these armed groups all around, they, they surveil society. So the secu you're, you're completely right that the risk is definitely there. Um, but I guess what we see sometimes, I'll give you an example. There was a teenager in, in Iraq, Haider Zaidi, who tweeted uh, that Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, you know, the former head of the al hajj al-Sha'bi, the Popular Mobilization Forces, was not a martyr but a spy. And the, the PMF commission managed to file a lawsuit that put this teenager in jail for seven years, uh, or some years. Um, however, there was a campaign launched where protesters started protesting, where social media influencers used the hashtag, where some of these reformists in government mm. pushed, where an MP pushed. And this campaign, these groups coming together to campaign connect collectively got him out of jail. Now, this is obviously a small example, and it's very isolated. And ex like we're talking about changing an entire system, we're talking about going against impunity. So 100%, this is not something that's going to happen overnight, and it's going to take decades and decades. Um, but we do think that c carefully constructed, not going after corruption head on, but looking at areas where these elites are susceptible. For example, in the healthcare, right? If you show that medicine is uh, expired, or, 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 or in Libya, for example, with, with what happens with dams. You know, these, when, you, when you focus on corruption in very specific, coherent, strategic ways that affect people every day and create these everyday violence, the idea is can this at least strengthen these networks? But 100% you're right that the dangers in this are very real. Mm -hmm. um, but you know what? A lot of the people who we talk to, you know, you say, you know, in Jordan, many people want to leave. A lot of people are staying put. And they're practicing politics and everyday politics in the ways that they, they, they want to. Not necessarily becoming an MP or, going through, or voting, but doing things that they think could help push the reform. And it's about supporting them, I think, but 100% the careful and, and, and risk is, is a very good and important critique. So there are a few things I also want to touch on. I want to talk, touch on Gaza. I want to touch more on corruption. Uh, but if there are things that other people want to touch on, if you want to ask a question, uh, there's a ask a question in the program page on the CSS website or in the description on the YouTube channel if you're watching it there. Uh, so please feel free to ask the question. They'll appear here and we can ask our panelists. Uh, Anti-corruption drives are a common theme of authoritarian regimes. Mm -hmm. There's nothing necessarily anti-regime or anti-establishment about anti-corruption. In fact, there, there are tools used by governments uh, around certainly around the Middle East and around the world. Xi Jinping has used anti-corruption in China mm -hmm. to purge people he wants to purge. How do you create the dynamics where you're actually able to introduce real accountability against real power and not that you're just creating theater to help create the appearance that there's accountability while, in fact, the system merely persists the way it is? I mean, um, I can, it's, uh, one way and, and something that a lot of the people in these countries who we talk to tell us they really want isn't necessarily a, a punitive, you know, the use of anti-corruption, as you say, as a, as a weapon politically. So if you lose power, all of a sudden corruption is being used to put you in jail, to go move away from that punitive and to move more towards proactive, right, to, to sort of something like transparency. People do not know. There isn't a government website. There isn't a watchdog. There isn't an idea of how the budgets are being spent. Of course, because that's at the heart of the elite bargain. And so that won't happen. But how do you pressure? And what is the role of different parts, segments of society in pressuring for a bit more 
transparency, right? In Iraq, for example, the parliamentary committee on the financial committee in parliament is meant to scrutinize budgets. But people on that committee over the years have, have, have told us that they don't have access to the budgets. So we're talking about these countries where there is no visibility on spending in these issues. And it's an uphill battle and very difficult, but that's what, it's, it's one way looking at it through transparency mm. rather than going after opponents. But part of the issue also is that citizens don't see accountability as, as something that is perhaps feasible, perhaps something that, that, that is in their interest to demand. I mean, as, I say, there's, as, as we've talked about, there's a keen interest in getting protection from elites rather than dislodging elites. It seems to me that the fundamental to what you're talking about is not so much either is not so much international actors dealing with elites in different ways, but publics, citizens dealing with elites in different ways. And my take on 20 years after the fall of Saddam Hussein is one of the great mistakes the United States made is it projected onto Iraqis that they would behave in ways that Iraqis simply didn't behave. So as we try to unpack that, how do we, if, if the goal mm -hmm. of international actors is to change the way citizens relate to their government, what are the instruments to do that when the citizens are first embedded in current patterns and second, the elites say, well, that's just what the foreigners want. We're the, we're the patriots who will take care of you. Not sure anyone has any magic answer to that. I honestly don't. But I do think that um, there is the way we should, maybe the way Yemenis or Iraqis or um, Lebanese imagine accountability is not exactly the same Western definitely written conceptualization of accountability. Um, it's a very different style sometimes and uh, less around written rules and less around laws and banking and credit card systems and it's more about shame and unwritten rules and honor and fear and humiliation and I think these are a lot of Yemenis would not worry if they're sanctioned by the United States of America um, or by the United Nations um, speaking about the warlords but I'm certain that they would be uh, extremely concerned if they are being uh, by other tribes um, internally within Yemen so there is I think uh, uh, definitely not invested enough on domestic and written definitely different from the international aspect of forms of accountability and they take shapes in a different ways in different countries they take a Twitter shape in Saudi Arabia on a Twitter they take a, some sort of a different shape in Lebanon or in Iraq of course because uh, the people of these countries their agency is stripped from them so definitely there is a limitation to what that can do but I think it is there and it is somehow can be invested on. I don't necessarily agree with uh, uh, the conclusion of the paper like to develop these networks because unless they are organically on the ground, you mm. can't really yeah. develop them. You know, you would do the same mistake, but maybe support them when yes, they exist. Not to support, and, not uh, to develop. Yes, yeah, that's definitely. Well, probably the only definitely. difference. I said like these networks of kind of pro accountability, they exist. You cannot develop them because the risk with developing these networks is almost the same end as like bringing democracy to Iraq. Mm. <laughs> and I think that the main problem also with that is to start with maybe of not doing, going back to your Iraqi example or the power sharing uh, samples that have been uh, thriving in the region, is every uh, power sharing model so far has been based around identity or based on an identity. And that's a fundamentally problem. You know, let's get the ten Sunni and Shiite and Arab into the. You know, let's get these three Yemenis who chukat on the right and these four who chukat on the left and put them on 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 this framework of uh, identity politics is easy and simple, and it does save a lot of headaches and good answers for policymakers. But it has been the number one sin in the West when thinking about the Middle East for the last 20 and perhaps 30 years and even th about thinking about the Palestinian but conflict But oftentimes today. voters vote on the basis of identity. I mean, you can, you, can, you can say that it's a mistake from the outside to look down and, and to, to sort of arrange everything in a, a quota system, but when you have large parts of the population that vote on identity, sectarian, tribal, 
Yeah, but even here, like when you look like pro-abortion, anti-abortion, it's all identity by the end of the day. Huh? But this is where political leaders, in my opinion, come and make the difference. Probably play the election games, but then you don't set an agenda and policy and foreign policy and domestic policy around identity. Because anthropology, identity is very good to understand anything and any problem. But it's horrible if you wear it at the set of mind as a decision maker whether you are a president or a, an MB or actually an ambassador to any country. And I think that is something we do need to think of more seriously than we did when it comes to all of the power sharing, but all of the deals that has happened in the region the last 30 years. Yeah, I think, you know, certainly in the case of countries like Iraq or Lebanon, the ethno-sectarian element of the identity became the problem, right? So there mm -hmm. wasn't policy debates have, being had on, for example, <laughs> Of course, not abortion won't be a policy debate there, but that type of debate, it was, you have, you have, who do you vote for? Well, if you are Sunni, you vote for Sunni. If you're Shia, you vote for Shia, and so on. Kurdish to Kurds. There wasn't, the system as designed by these elite bargains separated and created constituencies out of ethno-sectarian identities. Mm -hmm. And I think that became mm -hmm. the challenge of identity politics under an assumption that a Kurd will better represent Kurdish people, a Shia will better mm -hmm. represent Shia, Shia. And what we've seen actually is that's not always the case. They actually represent their own vested mm -hmm. interest instead. Mm -hmm. So it's about a political system where the elites right now are less able to use identity, right? You don't hear a lot of sectarianism being used by uh, these leaders anymore because they've been proven not to be that yes. representative. So anti-corruption actually is, is now an important marker for them. Everyone claims to be anti-corruption. Everyone claims to be uh, accountable and, and then going after sort of the bad parts of governance. Um, but that's not true, right? And, and we know that's not true. So it's about how to have political systems where voters could actually vote based on policy issues. But rather they have to want to, right? I mean, it's not just they can. They have, mm -hmm. they have to be motivated that way. As I say, Jordan is a perfect example yeah, of a place Granted, the elites are interested in enhancing tribal voting mm. because it helps keep the Muslim Brotherhood and the Islamist parties out of power. But part of that is that the, the tribal voters vote for tribes. And, you know, and, and, and part of that equation is that the, the voters have to behave as the rational actors you want the voters to behave as. And, and it's hard to get to that point. It's hard for foreign donors to make don voters get to that point. I mean, looking at Jordan, which is a very different case, right? Because we, it's a very sort of homogenous nation, but... Um, except for the division between East Bank and West Bank, Jordan. Except for the division between East, I mean, um, also Jordan and Christian. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there, there are divisions, but um, I mean, I would say that, you know, there, there is this push, uh, this electoral reform push to get parties to have, you know, actual policies rather than just, you know, voting along tribal networks. The issue is that, I mean, as uh, someone who comes from Jordan, is that in the 50s and 60s, they were, <laughs> the regime was very much against that, right? Mm. They, didn't, they didn't want that. And so I think that there is still a fear of putting that something was, on the table. You know, 60, 70 years ago. That's 60, 70 years ago, but we still have a cyber crimes law now today, and people are scared. I mean, yeah. people are scared. And if you put something on the table that challenges the current status quo, it doesn't, I would say, it, it challenges the regime or it might scare the regime, especially in the aftermath of the Arab Spring. I think it also scares donor countries, to be totally frank. I mean, I think they also do not want to shake the status quo too much, right? And Stability. so you have, yeah, and so this is the trade-off. So you have these projects that go nowhere, right? And you have entire populations in Jordan, in Syria, in Iraq, even these elites that, not elites, intellectuals that we're talking about, they rely on these NGO contracts, right? We're basically keeping these countries on an IV drip. And it's not, it's not really moving mm. you know, anything. But I don't think that that's just, I, I think that that's an issue for everybody. I think it's, uh, it's the regime, it's the, it's the people. I think the people don't trust the government. I think the government doesn't trust the people. Uh, I think the global north, as you put it, uh, doesn't trust the people either. Mm. And so this becomes a, a real problem if you want to move beyond identity politics or sectarian politics and actually, I think, move forward with positive change, which is why I keep getting you know, back to the, these recommendations, which I, I don't think we have today. But I think that it's, um, 
if you're go going to challenge the status quo, you're challenging yes. very embedded and potentially dangerous vested interests, mm -hmm. right? That have mm -hmm. capitalized on the status quo. Yeah. So how do you how do you move and, that? And they've done. I mean, in many of these countries, you've had had protests, right. and, and they've come out and, and they've called for revolution, right. uh, and and they've been you know from like repressed massively, um, and yeah, it's it's very difficult. Um, but you know, I still think that in many of these countries, there still are people who are looking for solutions. And I think what we're sort of trying to do is diagnose, in a way, what the problem is, um, and and what is the role of everyone in a potential solution. What what can be the role? So I completely agree on this point that it is not the role of an international actor, the U.S., the U.K., to go in and say, okay, we're now going to start supporting this protest movement. Because that's still, you're interfering in a social, right? Yes. Um, definitely not. But there's a lot of money being spent in development programming, right? A lot of checkboxes. Let's have dialogue. Let's bring this, this, this. We know these aren't really working. How do, can that money indirectly yeah. change its purpose and push for... Uh, connectivity building in a way. So completely indirectly and completely not a international or foreign backed sort of system, I think. It has to be bottom up and it has to be supported by uh, the population who want something different. All right, so, so let me ask you a really hard question, which is let's apply all this to Gaza, which is mm. likely to have some sort of political reconstruction over the next several years. How should the donor world think about the elite bargains that had entrenched Hamas in power? How do we think about some other kinds of structures? What's the role of a whole range of international donors in trying to engender a different future for Hamas, where there is gen or a different future for Gaza, where there's cool. genuine accountability, uh, where we don't have the kinds of structural violence which contribute to not only the, the death of many Palestinian civilians in this past week, but the likely death of many Palestinian civilians in the weeks to come. I mean, I think this goes back to uh, something you said at the beginning, which is what is conflict and what is post-conflict? Um, a ceasefire at some point does not, will not mean post-conflict for many people. I mean, Palestinians have been living through conflict nonstop. The state, you know, the state of Israel has now declared a war um, because of the Hamas's attack, uh, you know, which killed thousands. But it's about not jumping to that post-conflict and let's bring reconstruction in, but continuing to consider that many people are still in conflict even when there is a ceasefire and addressing some of these structural violence points, something like the blockade, something like these issues of, of, of the health, water, education, these things that have continued to kill a, a, a disproportionate amount of Palestinians, um, tackling those as well so that there can actually be something resembling peace uh, for, 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 for all sides. Do you think, by the way, it, similarly it can spill over between the Jordan and Palestine? And that? Mm -hmm. I think that's what the government is very scared about, especially mm. given the protests that happened today. Mm. Um, I think that's what everyone's scared about, not just in Jordan, but elsewhere. Um, I mean, I think that to, to John's question, though, we, we need to admit that there's a problem in order to solve it, right? And I, I see the being in D.C. for the past three years that there there is this sort of boomerang effect back to... Uh, elite bargains, normalization of ties between strong men mm -hmm. in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and that this is the more, the, the easier way to deal with the region as, as the U.S. seeks to focus on other issues. And I think that this recent escalation shows that if you ignore the drivers of conflict, yes. that it will continue to rear its ugly head. And it's not just Gaza, it's also Syria, which you know, we're not even talking about it today, but there is an also an escalation in violence in the Northwest. Mm. And that shouldn't be surprising to us. Um, and so I think that, 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 that we need to, I think that the U.S. administration, especially in the case of Gaza, because it does have leverage within that conflict, um, needs to acknowledge that normalization of Arab countries with Israel does not sort of resolve the underlying structural violence that you're talking about, right? And that will continue to rear its ugly head and It's like a transnational elite bargain. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> but who are, who are the actors 
mm. who can engage with Gazans beyond elites who can lead to a different future. I mean, let's just think about that piece. I mean, is, is there an important role for Israel or is there not an important role for Israel? Is there an important role for the United States? Is this something that has to be led by Arab states? Is this something that should be led by the Palestinian Authority to reconstitute itself? How do we, how do we think about if you could gather your dream constituency and not say, <laughs> well, everybody's in the room, right. who are the core people and what do you need them to do in this post-conflict environment to get Gaza to a different place? I mean, our director, uh, Dr. Sanad Bakir, just published a piece uh, this last week about this, how the regional leadership uh, countries should take more leadership in that. And I think that is probably the right beginning for that and how should we move in trying to, not just in Palestine and Gaza, but everywhere, that the region should take more uh, regional leadership into that. And I say that I agree with it because for one simple reason um, is uh, 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 elite or power and obviously also peace process and power Beyond many things, it's about perception. And there is no more perception as it was in the, best, the West, as in the past, that the West can lead this peace process in the Middle East. And I think that's another problem about perception. When you had an, the Abraham Accords, you thought, OK, the perception was you have the big guys in the room, everything is solved. And you had an illusion perception that these guys can also control everything. Similarly, I think with the different groups, that perception is no more at the moment, especially with how things are going brutally divisive, I think even in the West about the problem. And that does put us in a way, so in a, in a different challenge than the past. So the ideal question to me, because it's really difficult about whom, is rather about what. So because you will always have yeah. a problem if it's about who should be in the room, while we have more opportunity at the moment because we don't have a special elections or a clear line of legitimacy for anyone or for any group, then the best possible shot I believe we have is to create solidarities and the conversations and dialogues around topics. And that will create a more across a group. So for example, in Yemen, I think this has managed very well, a very small, small, small specific, but I found it an able to challenge the elite and able to actually in not so perfect society uh, and, and not so perfect current uh, uh, political uh, society was, for example, something called uh, the Mothers of Abductees, which was an association that was uh, created by a bunch of mothers who lost their sons in the Yemen war right now as hostages or prisoners. And what that did is it uh, created a national, across sectarian, across geographical solidarity. My son. Whether my son you know, is taken by the Houthis or the STC or the Emiratis or the Saudis or anyone. So, Having issues and having, whether in Gaza, in my opinion, or in Lebanon, or in Iraq, having conversations more around themes and topics is probably a better shot that we can create solidarity around it, overgo the elite bargain, and uh, try to have some sort of a thing for the people in this entire sense. Because this is also the entire problem of the elite bargain. There is nothing for the people in it, in any way. Okay. Can I just say one thing back to Gaza? Um, we, yes. We, yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, I mean, as we're looking at these normalization deals, what I had heard from, from many diplomats, including um, Ambassador Jeff Feldman, over the years, even before the, the normalization deals sort of took shape, was that a lot of Gulf countries were paying lip service to the Palestinian cause, and they really wanted to normalize with Israel for their own interests, right? And I think we can all sort of agree upon that. I think this changes the dynamics a bit, and makes them have to do more than pay lip service, potentially, if they want to move forward. And in this case, this is what I'm trying to look at, is how do you use elite bargains, um, you know, circling back to what I initially said, which is that it's not just about a lack of accountability, but mm -hmm. it's about sort of not rewarding impunity. And so how do you use these elite bargains in a way so that you at least extract something for the people mm -hmm within these bargains, right? It's not just elites carving up the pie or, you know, coordinating amongst themselves, but it's actually sort of being accountable to their people. And I think that, you know, Gulf states and other Arab countries are re realizing that their people actually still care about this issue mm -hmm. um, and that it will continue to come back. And, you know, potentially they have the power to work with Israel on sort of reducing the structural violence and, 
you know, defanging why Hamas came to power sort of in the first place, right? Um, that's complicated, especially now, but uh, I think that the importance of that is incredibly highlighted now as well. We're going to have to leave it there. I want to thank uh, Renad Mansour, one of the co-authors of Rethinking Political Settlements in the Middle East and North Africa from Chatham House, Fariad Muslimi, one of his colleagues at Chatham House, my colleague Natasha Hall, an expert on Syria and many other things. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you for our next program. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.